Thank you, Sarah. Okay, welcome to the March 6, 2019 meeting of the Northampton Community Preservation Committee. Uh, as always, we start off with general public comment, and there are none. So we'll move right to the approval of minutes. We have one minutes to approve, and that is the December 5th meeting. There's a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Um, Brian did not call the meeting to order <laughs> because Brian wasn't there. There. <laughs> so Linda, as I believe, did. Mm -hmm. So that was just the one thing. Good right. job, Linda. Um, any other comment? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Uh, chair's report. Just one quick uh, remark. We are back, thanks to Sarah, in the good graces of the Community Preservation Coalition. Uh, right. Stuart Saginaw was very uh, pleased that his trip to the West here was not in vain. And Sarah submitted the invoice for the full amount, which was what? Four thousand? Forty three hundred? Forty three hundred, something like that. So uh, perhaps we can all rest easier or not. Right. Um, that's it for my chair's report. So we have three meetings, uh, three applicants scheduled. We're going to start with uh, Bob, the broad uh, invasive uh, project, move on to Steve with the uh, National Register District and Florida's project, and then hopefully uh, have Wayne, uh, Wayne or Sarah's waiting for a text from Wayne, who's flying in from a meeting Good in Atlanta. Time. So we're hoping that he will join us. And if not, we'll switch the order around a little bit. Hope that, hope that, that, that he can make it. <coughs> uh, so without further ado, Bob from uh, Bertha <coughs> Coalition. And both Bob and Steve, uh, just a quick reminder that we read your proposal. And uh, some of us have uh, been out and visited the spaces, so just to keep that in mind. Uh, Bob, a familiar face here. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Yes, I keep coming back. Huh? <clears throat> for the past 10 years, Broadway Coalition has made a very serious effort to get rid of, or at least control, invasive plants in the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, which is Northampton's biggest conservation area and probably is most ecologically diverse. The problem with getting rid of invasive plants, <coughs> the two main ones which I wanted to mention, is that many of them are very abundant seed producers so that uh, <coughs> every year that they're in existence uh, they produce a lot of seed and many of them have very long-lived seeds that can persist for eight or ten years in the soil or at the bottom of the Fitzgerald Lake before they germinate. The other is uh, some invasive plants have extensive rhizomes. Rhizomes are actually underground stems <coughs> from which roots and shoots can bud off and reproduce plants in, in that fashion. So I think that if we've learned anything over the last ten years is the Invasive plants are extremely uh, persistent, and some of them are very hard to get rid of. Now, we've done <coughs> quite a lot of work uh, with the aid of volunteers, but also with grants from, uh, initially, from NRCS. Uh, a lot of our work, though, has been done with grants from CPA. Just to tell you a little bit about the background of some of the work we've done, <coughs> we've worked very hard, particularly in the last couple of years, to get rid of water chestnut in Fitzgerald Lake. We've known about this infestation for probably 10 or 12 years. But we adopted a new approach, which was entirely volunteer based, uh, in which <coughs> groups of people went out to the, onto the lake at three week intervals throughout the throughout the summer, actually from late spring to uh, the end of the summer, 
we usually had about eight to ten canoes or kayaks out on the lake with people pulling water chestnut. And in the <coughs> nine, uh, 2017 and 2018, when we uh, had adopted this more aggressive approach, we saw a dramatic decrease in water chestnut between 2017 and 2018, so from 1,100 pounds to about 300 pounds. We hope this trend will continue. We won't be sure until we <coughs> uh, continue this procedure for a couple of more years. Two projects, um, one having to do with Phragmites, or common reed, in the Broadbrook Marsh, and a stand of, very thick stand of Japanese knotweed on Marion Street. We initially started out with uh, grants from NRCS and the CPC, and we've gotten to the point <coughs> where things are enough under control that uh, Broadbrook Coalition is now taking charge of those projects and paying for the work that has to be done, which is greatly reduced from a couple of years ago. But two of the invasive plants really stand out as being exceptionally pers uh, persistent. And those are Glossy Buckthorn in Cook's Pasture and um, Spotted and Brown Knapweed, again in Cook's Pasture, but also on the dam. And uh, that work has been carried out largely <coughs> for us by uh, Politan Ecological Services, which is now uh, called Land, Ship Storage, uh, Land Stewardship Incorporated. And um, they have managed through the use of herbicide to reduce the population of knapweed and buckthorn significantly. But we're still not where we want to be. And it's not something that is easily taken on by volunteers because it involves, first of all, training in the use of uh, herbicides and taking a test, a state test for the use of herbicides to show your proficiency. It involves buying equipment and it involves buying insurance, fairly expensive insurance. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is something we've decided not to take on, but to continue using the services of uh, land stewardship to pursue the uh, elimination to the extent possible of, of both the buckthorn and, uh, and knapweed. Now both of those plants are abundant seed producers, knapweed somewhat more than buckthorn, but buckthorn also has a, a rhizome system so that it has a twofold uh, method of reproduction and uh, it can come back uh, fairly easily if we miss a tree and, or miss a shrub and it produces um, seeds in a given year or if the rhizomes aren't killed in the process of uh, herbicide treatment. And it is those two projects, those two plants that uh, form the basis of the application for continued <coughs> treatment in Cook's pasture and on the dam. There's also another persistent um, invasive plant. It's called black swallowwort. We have a small patch of it in Cook's pasture. It's been treated consistently for several years now, but uh, it's another one that's very hard to eliminate because of, uh, of seed production. You have to hit it at just the right time of year to avoid it. Uh, going to see and that time of year is generally June, early in the summer. So that's the basis uh, of our application and a little bit of history about uh, what we've done both with grant money and through volunteer activities in combating invasive plants at the Strode Lake. Thank you, Bob. Uh, questions for Bob? Just looking into the future, we always like to know sort of what to anticipate. It sounds like uh, a lot of the work has migrated to um, Broadbrook Coalition, which is wonderful. Do you anticipate needing to come back after this three-year cycle to CPC? It's, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's one that's very much in our minds as well. Um, we're, we're not entirely certain. Um, we hope that the knapweed and the buckthorn can be really knocked back to 
just a couple of percent in the next three years. But one of the things that worries me a lot is the seed persistence, and that's particularly true of the napweed, which uh, can persist in the soil for seven or eight years, according to the literature, maybe even longer. So uh, if you let it go, <laughs> you find it growing back again. We had a kind of unfortunate um, observation this year that the napweed was more abundant this summer, despite the fact that it's been treated con consistently for several years. Um, came back much stronger this year than we would have expected from previous years. And we think that maybe the reason for that is a combination of both seed in the ground that's been there for quite a long time, and also the particular weather conditions. But we have no, no proof of that. And the best we can do is keep working away at it and prevent it from going to seed. Are you eliminating any of its competitors by eliminating these other uh, invasives? I'm sorry? Are you eliminating any of its competitors by eliminating uh, some oh, of its Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, Just the, um, the way that Politan and his crew carry out their work, the um, application of herbicide to the plants is very targeted, very highly targeted. They use a, a, a fine mist, a sprayer with a very fine mist. And it's amazing how specific it has turned out to be because you can see a plant that's been treated that by the end of the summer, it's dead. What, what I meant is maybe you're preparing the ground. You've cleared other invasives out of the way and, and therefore that- Oh, then we might get, the swallow might get other flourish. invasives coming in? No, the swallower could flourish because you've eliminated the other invasives. It's a random question. Yeah. Don't worry. Well, what I was going to say is that the, <coughs> the uh, treatment of <laughs> buckthorn and napweed is very specific so that it doesn't kill the grasses and other plants in the immediate vicinity. It's amazing how specific it can be applied. So that it doesn't really create the conditions, which is a, you know, a, 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 an area that's clear to the soil where other invasives might take off. On that note, we heard from another applicant in the last round um, about a strategy that had, I think it was, it was specific to Japanese knotweed, but I'm sure I'm, one, I'm thinking there's probably studies that are similar, where it was a combination of um, herbicide and seeding with native, you know, they had tested out all these different na mixes of native plants mm -hmm. in locations to actually fill the area mm -hmm. to not have those open spaces. And, uh, so that's we uh, address this issue. <laughs> but you have a big area to deal with question. now, so. Yeah, we actually did that in the, um, the there was a, uh, a small portion of the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area on Marion Street. And it was a forest of Japanese knotweed five years ago. It was so dense you could hardly walk through it in the summer. And through uh, both cutting and herbicide treatment, it's reduced it to a very low level. But as part of that, we did plant a number of native shrubs <coughs> in that area. Not enough to cover the whole ground, but at least to uh, start some native plants in that area. It's a good strategy. In the pasture, in Cook's pasture, you really don't have to do it because there's so much natural vegetation that it just grows very well. Have you encountered any um, concerns or resistance or opposition from members of the Broadbrook Coalition regarding herbicide use? Um, we had a big debate about it uh, at, in, at um, at the board level in 2007. And um, we pretty much satisfied the entire board at that time that the procedure was generally safe, it was not uh, harmful to native plants. And uh, I think uh, we pretty much proceeded on that decision we made back then and we haven't heard uh, we have heard occasionally from other people, generally not members of uh, the Broadway Coalition, but uh, from other sources. But uh, <coughs> I think um, even though there is some controversy about the use of herbicides, it's generally considered pretty safe. And the way we're using it in particular with a uh, very fine spray targeted to individual plants, I think makes it even safer. 
and the Phragmites is under control? The Phragmites has practically all been replaced by cattail. Wow. Very satisfying. Mm -hmm. There's one, we had four patches of it, four stands of it. Um, one of them is nearing um, almost complete control. Uh, the other three, uh, one we've complete, apparently completely eliminated it. We don't see any phragmites at all. The other two we see maybe 10 or 20 plants come up each summer. And we have hired somebody to do follow-up treatment of those plants. Again, with rhodium? With BBC, with BBC funding. Uh, but, but with the herbicide rhodium? Yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Bob? Good to go. Bob, anything for us? Any parting words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> no particular words of wisdom. No, we're 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 getting to, to keep after invasive plants at Fitzgerald Lake, and uh, there's a large um, uh, will among board members in particular because we're the ones who take this on. To, uh, to give up the fight, and we think we're making slow progress. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, I think I'm right in that the schedule says in two weeks we're going to be having public comment following. Yeah. So, Bob, if folks want to come from BBC, uh, that's March the what? What is it? That'll be May 20th. May 20th. Welcome to encourage um, your members and yourself to come from that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next up is uh, Steve Strymer with the uh, Florence Abolitionists. Steve? <coughs> so, you may, I could, you, you made a point that you've read the application. So, I, time being what it is, and it's a kind of expansive application, I'm more than willing to dispense with all that and answer your questions if you have some, or I can pour through what I prepared. Uh, how long is what you prepared? I haven't read it yet, but probably four minutes of first of narrative, and then I run through the slideshow so people aren't, aren't aware of some of the properties. I think four minutes and slides is fine. Yeah, yeah. Right, please. please. Okay, okay. Yeah. The 40, we would have. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and digressions. Um, <coughs> so I'm not, uh, the main point I wanted to argue, and I'm, I'm guessing that this could be the sticking point, is partly, you know, why so much money, uh, and why so much of it, instead of just a simple historic district, why so much of it is going to be, money is going to be allocated to the statement of historical context, um, and I just wanted to kind of uh, make a case for that. Uh, Catherine Grover, who we've worked with on two other uh, nominations, uh, has demonstrated expertise along with her familiarity with the national figures that are key to the local story to allow her to give the most comprehensive appraisal to date of Northampton's considerable role in abolition of slavery and for equal rights in the country. Um, discussion of... That didn't work. How do I advance it if it's not the arrow? Uh, enter key or the left? There we go. Okay. Um, people in Northampton may not know about some of these characters. This is Arthur Tappan, Lewis Tappan, um, and then of course others like Sojourner Truth, David Ruggles, Lydia Mariah Child, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, and then Joshua Levitt, William Howard Day, Charles C. Burley, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, and Anna Garland Spencer um, are among those who touched base here. They will identify which of the edifices that remain from the period are worthy of standalone National Res Register designations as well. The statement of historical context allows broader research and can include discussion of these people and institutions whose related edifices no longer exist 
Northampton's important contribution to anti-slavery efforts of both wings of the abolition movement is unique and deserves a thorough telling by an experienced researcher. Catherine Grover is ideally suited for the job, having completed the narratives for the Dorsey Jones House, the Hill Ross Farm, and the context study for Underground Railroad in Massachusetts generally. Um, the district portion concentrates on extant structures and their former inhabitants. Uh, we have so many contiguous contributing elements that a relatively compact district can be delineated. The designation helps to point out the current state of the structures which will help inform future preservation initiatives. Of the value of establishing national registration, na national register designations, Neil Larson, the architectural historian for the project says, National Register projects expand people's knowledge about their communities, architectural and cultural history, and raise their consciousness about the importance of this history in their daily lives. In that way, they can promote the development of more inclusive and more broadly supported preservation planning. National Register nominations can be tremendous catalysts for community efforts to appreciate their built environment to manage growth and to protect if not enhance a particular quality of life. Uh, there are certain tax benefits, eligibility for owners of property uh, for a 20% investment tax credit for certified rehabilitation of income producing historic structures. Federal tax deductions are also available for ch uh, charitable contributions for conservation purposes. Uh, qualification qualification uh, for federal grants for historical preservation are also available when funds are available. What are some other benefits? Um, while there is potential preservation funding through matching funds, there is an ongoing benefit to have owners be fully aware of the historical importance of their property. They in turn will hopefully make sure subsequent owners know that they have a responsibility to be good stewards. Districts can have a positive effect on property values. The National District has the ability to attract tourism. African American tourism is the fastest growing sector of, um, and the district will help establish Northampton and Florence in particular as sites where the flavor of the abolitionist period is preserved and interpreted. Grover is an accomplished author and intends to write the narrative in a form that we would be able to publish with images and maps in a book that will help the public understand just what we have here. Finally, I was truly appreciative of the support letter of Bonnie Parsons, who prepared the application for the recently approved Pomeroy Terrace National uh, Historic District. Bonnie brought her UMass Master's architectural students to Florence to hear how we rediscovered the many African-American homes in the district, establishing this dis district, which in most cases recognizes Northampton citizens of modest economic means, helps balance the Pomeroy District and Elm Street Districts, where properties substantially represent the professional and economic elites of the city. Here's what she said about the value of employing Larson and Grover. The team chosen to prepare the nomination is stellar. Neil Larson and Catherine Grover have set standards for architectural historical research in this period, standards that are now maintained by the Massachusetts Historical Commission and the National Park Service. What makes the nomination compelling at this particular time is the more than substantial amount of historical architectural documentation gathered by the DRC and the previous work of the Fisher-Grover team. Without this body of information, it would take new researchers many costly hours to, to prepare a nomination. So not only is this district eminently worthy of listing on the NR at the national level, it has the right team at the right time to prepare the nomination. Um, I should also mention that uh, uh, it will go a long way. Though we're concentrating a lot on African American presence, the equal rights part portion of this is certainly not going to be neglected either with the Northampton Association of Education and Industry uh, not having yet really fully uh, achieved what recognition it should have. In my humble view, it is co-equal with Brook Farm and Hopedale and even Beacon Hill for uh, some of uh, for this period of, of, of uh, commun uh, communities and um, anti-slavery activism. Uh, we have um, three books already. 
um, Rebels in Paradise, which talks about the evangelical wing of the abolitionist, the communitarian moment um, by Christopher Clark, who started me off on this journey about the, uh, the radicals up in Florence. We have a new biography of David Ruggles, and I thought I'd end by uh, just reading one section from William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison wrote a number of letters from Northampton when he visited here. Um, he, uh, as did Lydia Mariah Child, who I hope everybody in Northampton learns much more about as, uh, through this kind of district stuff. But I, I love this one piece here, because here's William Lloyd Garrison, the, the radical of all radicals of reformers uh, for abolition uh, in Northampton, in sort of staid, conservative Northampton. And he's visiting downtown at a uh, temperance rally. He's uh, writing to a friend through the Liberator. In addition to the anti-slavery observance of the 11th Ultimo in this town, there was a public temperance celebration on the part of the Cold Water Army, Martha Washingtonians, etc. In the procession, there were not less than seven or 800 children with badges and banners, a very pleasing spectacle. It was gratifying to perceive that strong as is the aristocratic spirit in this quarter, no distinction was made among them on account of complexion. Colored children were not only allowed to walk in the procession, but in some instances were coupled with the white ones, and I saw no token of contempt or disapprobation among the numerous spectators. This is progress, I said to myself, abolition progress. So this is Garrison in our conservative, evangelical, but equally ardent abolitionist downtown Northampton, which is becoming increasingly clear how important that wing of abolition was in Northampton and how effective it was as the Liberty Party. One of the founders is one of the people that we'll talk about, Moses Breck. Um, and to have Garrison downtown and acknowledging, in spite of these people who he had high contempt for, that this was progress to see them marching together in Northampton. This was probably rare, might not have happened elsewhere. So this is, these are the kind of seeds that people like J.P. Williston, evangelical though he was, you know, um, had laid for Garrison. So I'll just go quickly through some of these other little pieces up here uh, of some of the homes in the district and some of what we've been doing. Um, here, uh, we've started to develop with Forbes Library this year, Underground Railroad Tours in Northampton. There's two of them. Here's, uh, this is the East Tour, and this is the Northwest Tour. Um, and many of these sites are, are no longer there, but a number of them are. Um, this is one that we discovered down near where I live, uh, uh, Moses Breck's house. Uh, and this is where the Catherine Linda case was born out up at Smith College. This is probably one that, though it's not on its original foundation, might be able to be a National Register nomination by itself. Uh, this is the uh, 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 Charles Porter Huntington House uh, and City Hall, where the first meeting against the Fugitive Slave Law was uh, held. We might. Um, can you tell us? City Hall on, net, on the National Register as a standalone right now? Not as a standalone, it's very yeah. down. Uh, it, it really should, there's some of these that, and this could be help us get to that. This is Seth Hunt's house uh, where uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Parker Pillsbury, all these people stayed when they came to town uh, on, on Conn Street. And this is his house up on uh, Elm Street. Uh, this is where Lydia Mariah Child stayed when she lived in uh, Northampton next door to a former slave auctioneer at Mary Ellen Chase House. Um, this is Henry S. Gare's house uh, in the district, in the Pomeroy Terrace district. This is uh, the house, Stark Brother House, where Basil Dorsey stayed. This is John Brown's house, the fugitive slave John Brown. Uh, this will never go on the register because we found his little house inside this house. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, this is uh, where abolitionists met in the <coughs> upper rooms. So um, this is, I could go on, but um, is that good enough for you? I mean, I could go through all these houses. If you want to see more of them, I'm happy to go through them. But I'm wanting more, more than anything to answer any questions that have developed for you all. Looks like you're forecasting another CPA application, maybe in the What's that? coming oh, years. What's that? Oh, down for North, Northampton proper? Uh-huh. Um, 
I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know whether there will, I mean, for a, a district itself downtown, I don't know if they'll, they would have one that would be, uh, uh, have enough integrity. And one of the reasons why uh, I, that we're really interested in this is that, you know, these are like this one here, uh, Palmer so these, these are fancy, so a lot of these are fancy homes. This one is an interesting home. Of, uh, owned by a uh, barber by the name of Timothy Harley, who harbored a fugitive slave in this house on Fruit Street. But uh, a lot of them uh, up in Florence, what is their modest homes, you know, which uh, won't that need to be protected equally as much as the you know the other houses and recognized, and, and they create a good tour. I don't know how uh, we give tours a lot up there. So um, that's the rationale that I have for doing it. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, I, I wish it would be less than this. I, I found the old 1976 uh, attempt to have a National Historic District up in Florence, and boy, that, it, those were primitive times. Uh, it's become the very high-end kind of professional thing to get districts like this through there. It used to be more of a, a little more grassroots than, than it, it is now. A lot um, more documentation required today. Yeah. So that's that's really why, because it'll take a lot of time. As you see, their project is 62 weeks um, it, that they're predicting it'll take from start to finish. Other questions for Steve? I, I do have one question, Steve. The um, the proposed district is quite large, and I didn't count the number of properties that are in it. Um, do you anticipate pushback from any of the property owners? I actually don't. We've, we've done a fair amount of work with all of them, including what I consider some of the more conservative ones who have become quite friendly. And I think people enjoy us walking through the streets there and having their house be part of this. Um, so I don't, I don't really anticipate a lot of it. And I don't think um, folks, you know, this is down um, this isn't in the middle of Florence. I don't think they'll feel neglected or whatever by having this district that's uh, from this period be uh, apart from it. So I don't, and we're willing to do groundwork to try and make help with that. Um, I believe the, how it goes is they, at the state level, once the district's approved, they contact all the, pro all the owners in, in the district. So I don't know when it, what happens for anybody to object, um, except to hear the story. You know, we might want to, I don't know exactly. We'll probably talk with the Historical Commission about the best way forward with that, because having them on our side will help, I think. And then just one other question. Um, I noticed at the end of the scope of work, Neil has proposed um, along with the um, commission review, um, a public forum or presentation to the public. And um, is that something that you think that you will organize or is that something that you're thinking that would be done with the historical commission or Neil would do that or? Not, not sure yet. Oh. I mean. Um, I think it's important that's I, Neil, Neil came and spoke at our, at our Ruggles uh, centen you know, uh, bicentennial. Uh, talk. He was great on his feet with a good slideshow. Catherine is a really wonderful speaker, and I'm, I think she'd be great to have to have outside. Because I think one of the benefits people have heard me talk a lot about all this stuff. So having those folks with sort of you know, broader, uh, and we could even make it bigger than that. Of course, we could have this be a big celebration. That would be another, you know, with tours. And actually, one of the things uh, that we'd like more would be that more of these homes were uh, public, the public could go into. I don't know if people remember, I certainly don't, um, the uh, 300th anniversary of Northampton, one of the things they did was have people open their homes to allow folks to come in they, to see it. And a few of these houses we, we'd really love to do that with. And I think we probably can, now, especially down at the Ross Homestead and the Dorsey Jones house. Mm -hmm. um, you've really been the prime mover behind the Ruggles Center, and it sounds like you've been the prime mover 
behind this as well. Who else stands behind you? Um, names that no, are. No, no, no. Just how much help do you have? How much? Um, well, one of our principal folks that really helps us a lot in many ways is Lisa Baskin. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she, she's. She, she and Faith Deering, I don't know, she's a historical entomologist at Historic Deerfield um, and is intending to have our own little cocoonery at the Ruggles Center sometime, oh, maybe this coming summer. Uh, kids love that kind of stuff. And they put together the child exhibit and did a really wonderful job on that. And Tom Goldscheider's a master's in history trained by Bruce Laurie, who's one of our leading guides. He's taken a lot off my plate to be able to lead more walking tours. And we're ha actually on April, April 13th, we're having a Teachers Institute um, with him at the lead of that on a mass, <coughs> on a, uh, mass humanities grant. And uh, Stephanie Pasternak, I encourage people to go to our new website. If you haven't been to our website in a while, it's really quite something. She spearheaded getting that all done. Um, we have a librarian um, and Sarah, uh, one of our people should know, one of the treasures in Northampton is Marie Panic at Historic Northampton. And she is our recording secretary, and nobody takes notes like Marie. We have the best. We have the best notes you've ever seen, and uh, so we have really good stuff like second that. Best. What's that? The second best note takers. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, President. Um, so uh, we have about uh, we meet once a month, and we have about ten people that regularly show up, and then we have a total of about seventeen people that are still our members, but uh, do other kind of tasks. We're gonna raise sugar beets at the, uh, at the Grow Food Farm, this, and, and probably flax as well. Uh, Faith and, and Tom are working on that. So we have a lot of ideas that way. We're pretty ambitious. Um, you know, we're not great at fundraising. I wish we were better at that. But what kind that. of loop-in do you have with the Stark Northampton? A loop-in? Yeah. I mean, how we interact with them? Exactly. Um, <clears throat> well, or what do you see coming out of this? If and the Sark Northampton is that part of your vision for this? I'm really close with everybody at Historic Northampton. I was on the board there for a while, and uh, we explored at one point merging, mm -hmm. but we decided we'd prefer to stay, you know, our own little thing up there. I don't know if down the road it might happen. Um, but uh, we have programs together. I've given three or four talks there. Other people have, and um, we've done walking tours from historic. One of that, one of those two walking tours left from historic Northampton. We had, by the way, three walking tours this uh, last year, and we had 70 people on every walking tour. It's pretty amazing the interest in this. So, the district up in Florence in the historical context will be a step forward for teachers and citizens to be able to, to really dig in because if you read Catherine Grover's stuff she really goes pretty deep and we'll find she'll find stuff we haven't found yet. Other questions? Okay. Um, Steve I want to thank you for, for the work you've put in so far on this and also the work that you've done down at the Royal Center. Um, normally, on these, on any proposals that come before us, I'm interested in, in hearing about, um, particularly when you're going to hire hire somebody, um, any sort of competition in in contracting it out and that type of thing. Um, but in this case, I'm really I'm not I'm not concerned. Um, I know that thirty thousand dollars is is not a a small amount of money, but I can't really imagine how you could do the scope of work that you have envisioned for less than that. Um, and I think that the, 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 the credentials of the people that you put together to do the work are are impressive. And so, you know, I think that I think that um, I think we're going to get value for dollar, and I think it's going to be a good product. And I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it, and looking forward to supporting it. Thank you, Chris. David. Yeah, I want to uh, maybe expand a little bit on something Martha touched on. Um, you know, I think hypothetically, a hundred years from now, 
someone wanted to do a similar study on the history of, say, equal rights for LGBT community or the fight against global warming or in Northampton, say. And there's clearly historic things happening today. And what do those things have to do with the buildings that they happen to have? A lot of times marginally nothing. You know, I mean, the great things happen in a lot of places. They happen to happen in buildings because it's cold outside. You know, does it matter that what the, so I think that makes the kind of study that you're doing um, in a sense more important because it's really diving into the history of what happened beyond the architectural style, if any, of those buildings. Um, but I think it also makes sort of like you said, it's a 62 week process. You know, like what has happens on week 63? You know, clearly you just love these very heavy books here, and there's, those are four books that most people in Northampton probably will never <laughs> read. And you know, it's a lot to go into. And I would venture to say, you know, someone who reads these, uh, um, you know, MHC documents a lot of times. You know, many people, most people don't read them. Um, so I think it puts even more importance on what happens at the end of the project in terms of community engagement, community engagement through the process, and then like well, having a plan for what are you going to do with this at the end of it. Because um, it doesn't, you know, there's no demolition, you know, restrictions at the end of this process. Um, it's It's, you know, I know it's a first step, um, but I think thinking long and hard about like what happens at, at the end of this, and to what degree, you know, you said fundraising is tricky. Well, fundraising is not tricky with this group. I think this is a group that really wants to fund this project, and you're not going to find any. Well, we'll see, but I think people want to fund it, but how can, is there any way to leverage some of the money you're going to get for this project to get some of that activity beyond just a paper document um, into this process? Because I think that's, in a sense, more, the historians would like nothing more than to drill deep and write a thousand pages on, on this stuff. But I, I think you'd be better off with 900 pages and a much more expansive public engagement um, if, if that's possible. So. Well, like I was saying, we're pretty ambitious, and I'm pretty ambitious about it, and I kind mm -hmm. of think ahead. <clears throat> like I was saying, if you, Brook Farm is a national historic um, landmark, which is a higher designation than any, I don't know where we have a historic landmark. Uh, we have only a couple in Western Mass. Emily Dickinson Museum. Um, there's, there's, very, there's very few. Um, there's more out in East, uh, somehow or other they, they get a leg up. You know, I looked at some of the historic landmarks. If you want to look at some of the historic landmark stuff, um, you, you know, yeah. so my, I am totally certain that this deserves historic landmark status. The Ross Homestead and the Grove Food Northampton Farm should be a national historic landmark, in my view. It's on its original foundation. The people that are there now, luckily the owners, are re are restoration folks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and and having that kind of having that kind of designation, I would like to claim. I, I want to talk the city into stop being so lit, lit, worrying about lit, uh, lawsuits and do something with the dam down there. Mm -hmm. That par park could easily come into town ownership. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah with People the swim there all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's like really disingenuous to say, we don't want to, we want to look the other way because somebody's going to drown like they did last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just don't buy it. I, you know, so I'm saying having, doing something with that which invites people to that spot where it really all happened. I'm trying to convince folks along this way that what happened in the, the, the uh, little utopian community was unique in America at the time. There was, I, I asked everybody else, find me a place where um, with white men, women, African Americans, and fugitive slaves all had an equal vote. I don't know of one myself. And that, to me, in this climate, in this day and age, mm -hmm. and with Northampton where it wants to go and is going, mm -hmm. is a big deal. Right. So that's where, you know, those kind of things at the end of this. Th mm -hmm. This is like, this is a midway kind of project, in my view. Mm -hmm. There's so much on the other end for preserving what we have. So 
I'm not feeling threatened by you. I'm, I, I'm no, telling I'm, you, I'm, I'm, not yeah, I'm all about the other end of this, yeah. you know, and that's what we've been about. And I'd like to try and I would like to rebuild Josiah White's oil mill at the dam and have that be a national park. Mm -hmm. Actually, because the only national park we have here is the sprint, is the armory, right? So this would be a great counterpoint, just like this, this district is a counterpoint. I'm, I love Pomeroy Terrace, but it's all about the elites. This is a great counterpoint to that the, a, a national park in, in Florence, which I think is, it makes sense to me, right? um, would be a great counterpoint to the armory. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see, we'll see what happens, but I, I'm keeping after it. And I, I think the Ruggles folks are pretty ambitious about it too. So. To be clear, clear, I'm not questioning the validity or, or need for this study. I could, uh, it obviously is something that has to happen. I just know that the dollars are hard to come by, so any time we can create something that's beyond, that gets off the page, you know, yeah. it's always great. So. And, and I've been some of that's maybe held over at the Rogan Center. It's, there's a lot going on, so the more that that can be gotten out to the community, I think. One of the it great things the we just did was to, uh, I had the best time having the Malcolm X Cultural Center at UMass to try and bridge you know, the, the, the big divide down the river where they never come here and we never go there. That was great. We had a great walking tour. They, they, nobody had ever heard of the history. You know, it was really exciting. So bringing people, it gives you a reason to bring people across the river you know, a lot and up from Holyoke and Springfield. <coughs> All right, well, thank you. Well, Unless, on, am I going to dismiss? <laughs> Don't go away that. No, not, not quite yet. Other, other questions? Um, so my understanding is what the thirty thousand dollars gets us is all the supporting documents to uh, apply for this or whatever the word is for this national registered nomination form. So it goes into the nomination form. What are the chances do you think of it of, of it not succeeding? Three percent. Three percent. Wow. Uh, the reason I say that is that um, uh, Betsy Friedberg at the Mass Historical Commission is encouraging of this project, and she's actually worked with Catherine and Neil on all sorts of things, and uh, she kind of gets how important this is, and she's one of the people. I, I'm, maybe I, I don't know the politics there currently, but she's still there. She's the National Register Director, so if she's behind it, it will happen. If it's done, you know, it's done well, and you know, so yeah, she she'll make sure. Um, part of the story, yeah. people should understand that the two national register uh, properties we have, the Ross Homestead, which is down at the Grove Food Northampton Farm, 123 Meadow Street, and the Dorsey Jones House at 191 Nonatuck Street, the Mass Historical Commission paid Catherine and Neil to do those nominations. We didn't have to pay them to do those. And that was because they were chosen above all of only two other properties in all of Massachusetts were chosen to represent the Underground Railroad in Massachusetts. And I, that was a, a larger context study that Catherine wrote about the Underground Railroad. And like our district in Florence, they chose those two properties and a couple out in Boston to be on the register and, and part of the National Parks Underground Railroad Network to free so I, I think we have a really, really good shot. Any other questions? So once again, Steve, two weeks from uh, today on March the 20th is our book and comment mm -hmm. session. So if you'd like to invite folks from the Ruggles Center or elsewhere to um, speak, they are welcome and we would be delighted to have them. All right, one more question. Is there any has there been any discussion about trying to make this a local historic district, or are you really? Working? I wouldn't. I would never try that. Okay. Not in Florence. No. Okay. Because of, of the restrictions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Straight Thank you. off the airplane from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? That's right. Um, uh, uh,
Hello, Wayne. Welcome back. Welcome back. My ears are still ringing for the plane. So <laughs> if I see, you know, we get too high or too low, you can tell me. Am I up? Should I just walk you through this? Sure. Okay. Right. I mean, you want to use the you 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 put this in? Yeah. yeah. Um, you can just pull it the eject? It doesn't matter. So, thank you. Um, so, should I just go ahead? Please, let's begin. So, where I, I'm presenting sort of two things tonight. Um, one is asking for funding for four acquisitions, but in, in the last open space plan, one of the goals that we had was to lower our costs for the soft costs for, for open space acquisition. So one of the things we did this time is we looked at uh, eight purchases that we're working on um, and said, often we come before you and we say, you know, we'd like to ask for some CPA money and then we're looking for some other match. Fundraising is a grant. Um, this time, what we're doing is we're asking for a much higher percentage of these four parcels, and then we have some other parcels we're buying which we're not asking for any money for. Um, so that way, it's still the same idea of your match being for a portion of it, but then those parcels it doesn't have. I mean, CPA is great, but it comes with it some extra costs, and so if we do a greater percentage of some parcels. And zero percent of other parcels, and it doesn't have those costs. And so that that's why I'm presenting this way. So again, we go through all these parcels, some of which we're asking for your funds, and some we're being elsewhere. But you, you paying for the parcels we've identified leverages a, a financial package. Um, so on this map, you see uh, seven of the eight parcels. One more parcel has come forward since I did this map, so I don't have a slide for that. Um, but you can see they're sort of scattered around, they're scattered around. Um, I think you all know, but generally we've rebranded the names for our conservation areas to be sort of aspirational, where we expect to, to connect them all. So the left section of the city, up and down, is all the Mineral Hills, it has subtitles, Mineral Hills, Galena Mine, Mineral Hills, other things. And the next row of hills is the Salma Hills, north to south. So even though these parcels are all spread around, they, they sort of represent a couple of small areas. So I'm just going to walk you through each parcel. So five, six, seven are sawmill hills? Oh, all sawmill hills, correct. And five, six, seven are not, they're, down, they're in the future, you're doing it totally on other money. That's correct. Right. So, but not so much in the future. We, we're, we plan to do them at exactly the same time period. So I'm just using more and showing you how we're leveraging those. So wait, all, you're doing all eight, actually. That's right, all eight. Where's eight? Where's eight? So um, it, the, I'm sorry. The eighth one is actually, I'm going to point over here. It's in the meadows um, oh, yeah. over here. It's the old historic, the, the historic Mill River before it was diverted in 1939. Oh, yeah. yeah. Went through downtown and then went back to Mass Audubon. Yeah. And so there's a parcel right there, sort of Old Springfield Road and Manhattan Road come together. Um, and that, the reason it's on the slides is we were sort of negotiating when we had this, but we didn't know we reached an agreement. We've, we've just reached <coughs> that parcel. Um, so I'm going to walk you through each one, but I first want to talk briefly about this Northampton one. Um, I can't remember if we've talked with you about this before, but I don't think you have. No. So we just completed an open space, we do an open space recreation and multi use plan every seven years. And we completed the plan this last uh, spring. Um, and one of the goals it had was to have a Northampton one, a single trail that's sort of a loop trail, 26.2 miles. Um, the entire trail would be good for walking. Some portions would be on existing bike paths where obviously you can walk or bicycle. Um, some portions would be good only for hiking. Some might be good for hiking and mountain biking, depending on where you are. Um, with maybe some later feeder trails. So on this map, red over on this map is the proposed Northampton one. Still working on refining it, so it's not an exact route, but it's pretty close to what it would be. 
um, a little bit over a third of it will be on future, in either existing or future bike paths. The rest will be earthen trails through the woods. The reason I'm showing you this map is you can see how much the trail is, is either existing bike paths or goes through existing open space parcels. But obviously there's gaps. It doesn't connect all the parcels. So those gaps, almost by definition, have become higher priorities for us to buy land. You know, our, our first priority for buying land is always primarily about resource protection. Right? We want to protect really important ecological features. And that remains the top of our list. But we also want to connect them together for both ecological reasons and for human use of the areas. And so this has helped us think about you know, how are we going to some, someday make those linkages. And some of the parcels we're going to talk about are important parts of these linkages. So that, that's why I'm showing this map. So let me just walk you through each one. So this first one is um, part of the Beaverbrook Greenway. Um, those of you who did the site visit came with me. This is the one behind the St. Mary's and Assumption Cemetery uh, in Leeds, it's off Haydenville Road. Um, so if you go from Leeds towards Haydenville, there's a cemetery on your left. Um, and there's 44 acres behind that cemetery. Um, we will be buying that entire parcel of land. It's a really spectacular piece of land. It is rolling hills, uh, ledge outcroppings, at least one certified vernal pools and possibly some additional non-certified vernal pool. Um, and the reason this opportunity came forward, frankly, is more people are being cremated. Um, and so the Catholic Church is looking carefully at their cemeteries and saying, we're not going to need as much space for cemeteries. And we said, great, you're looking at this anyway. We think this land is so much ledge and wetlands that it wouldn't do any good for cemetery anyway. So we did an assessment of where the current cemetery is, another four to seven acres where the current cemetery could expand, and then the back land beyond it where it couldn't. Um, anyway, this property first came under our radar from Lead Civic Association. They approached us and lobbied us to, to go after the parcel. Um, I, I have to tell you, it was individuals at Lead Civic, so I don't know if there's a formal vote from Lead Civic or individuals, but it, you know, it was a lot of individuals at, at Lead Civic, so they're very excited. Um, the working title is Beaverbrook Greenway. It actually is a naming dilemma because this is where Beaverbrook intersects with the Mill River. So this is a working title. Maybe it's going to be, you know, so just take it a great salt. So really exciting piece. Um, this one's most important ecologically. Um, but it also is a great trail opportunity, and it has some opportunities for that Northampton one. So I'm going back to this view here, and except for I can't get the cursor to work. Oh, it's there. So this area right here, if you can see my little arrow, that's the area we're talking about. Um, so we'd have some opportunity, so that would help fill in some of the gaps in this Northampton one. I'll just keep going with extra other parcels, but there's questions that I go through, you know, certainly stop me and I can talk about that in more detail. Um, we just, so you know, the, the one piece we've already bought from the cemetery, um, with bike, the bike path property itself was, a, was used to be part of the, the Catholic Church property, and we bought that property and we bought the land, the, 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 the Beaverbrook Bridge, the spectacular arch bridge, the bike path there and the area between the bike path and the river we already bought from the Catholic Church 10 years ago, eight years ago, something like that. Um, so at least we sort of had already started this developing this relationship. So second one, again, you see there's a key map on the left. This is one more unit on the Mineral Hills Greenway. Um, this one's not so important right now for the main Northampton One Trail, but it might be a good spur. So um, this is part of the John O'Masta Farm. So if you know where they used to be llamas, maybe they are still llamas um, on West Farms Road. John has a lot of land. He's currently negotiating with the city and the state and the federal government to put an agriculture preservation restriction on that entire farmland. Um, we may come back to you at some point. That's at least a year out, maybe two years out. 
that's not moving very fast. But in the assessment, this property um, isn't eligible for an agriculture preservation restriction because it's not prime farmland, and so it's sort of being an orphan. Um, and so we wanted to buy the land sort of to lower his basis. So we, buying the land now is a benefit that he would have a massive capital gains if this entire APR happened at once and we bought this land. So it's a benefit of buying the land now, you know, letting him have a relatively small capital gain this year, we hope, and then a year or two later we keep it to the APR. Um, it's not shown on this map, that's the main parcel. It would also include a right of way from this parcel out to West Farms Road. Um, and so that's the link where we would come at West Farms Road is just a little bit south of the old Bill Willard property. And we're buying, we're about to buy 150 acres of land from Bill Willard. Again, they don't connect yet. Um, so I'm not promising you a trail, but the goal is to connect this going out that direction. So again, not Northampton one, but hopefully a, a future connection. This property became really important to us. We bought a couple of parcels with your help um, called the Galena property that's south of this and west of this. So before this was sort of landlocked, but now it connects to, to our existing holdings. So. so very nice, it has um, on our property already some spectacular ledges with westerly views. The very westerly part left as you look at the screen includes an extension of those ledges. Um, so it's, it's nice from a, you know, a, a feature standpoint. Um, so the next one is also Mineral Hills just a little bit south of this. Um, if the, the land to the north of this, um, so let's bring the mass here. So this, we have two, we have two parcels we, we've owned for a while. This property we got as part of the, um, the Ridge subdivision, it was a cluster. And then this property we bought as a major project with your help um, we bought, I think it's 80 acres, I'm not exactly sure. Um, it was originally going to be a subdivision. Um, and if you remember, we carved out four lots. We gave to Habitat for Humanity, which are currently under construction, and kept the rest of the land. <coughs> so then we took those two parcels, connected them together. We've already built the trail that connects them. Again, this is Mineral Hills, um, Hannibrook parcel that aspirationally would someday connect to the rest of the Mineral Hills. This would extend that south. So if some of you have heard of the new Wagon Trails Dog Park, mm -hmm. that's what this is. So the woman who owns this has agreed to sell us this back land um, out here. So it, it would sort of then mean we have open space that surrounds or abuts on two sides the Wagon Trail property. And it's a really gorgeous piece of property. It has some area which was old gravel pits that are you know recovering gravel pits but they actually have some rich wetlands and then some areas which are never mined um and uh, is a major stream that flows through the westerly part so really nice piece of property um is there anything you can say about that thin oklahoma shape between this property and the rest of your oklahoma. and the rest Can't of your handle. yeah that that yeah. one um you know, it's on our list to go after. Um, so yes, we're interested. We're very interested in coming down here. This was the old, it's part of the old Clear Falls. So Clear Falls was a swimming area on the Manhattan Brook. Um, and they closed the swimming area. I lose track of time. Don't trust me for any of that time, but 10 years ago-ish. Um, the man who owned it just died, I think a year ago. I'm not sure what the estate is doing. Um, you know, you're it, tracking generally. Yeah, we're definitely tracking. We, we made an offer on it three or four years ago. Sam Crishone, by the name of Andrew died. We made an offer three or four years ago, and he had visions of hundreds of homes that just didn't, you know, we're not willing to pay more than the property is worth. Um, so it didn't go anywhere, and, I, and frankly, we haven't followed up in the last couple of years. So mm. I'm not sure it is. Um, there's some development value way over to the west off this map, but that back land is. You know, what we always wear at this back land is not that you could dozens of homes. It just it doesn't have that kind of development value. But sometimes you could put one massive estate lot 
you know, with a half mile drive. We have a few of those off Chesterfield Road, off. I always say as a planner, the sort of place that as a person I would love to live, I totally get it, but as a planner they're horrible. You put one house with a half mile road that, you know, divides up the area. So yes, we'll go after that someday, but. Okay. Um, and we're getting this at a particularly good price because as part of the permit condition, um, the wagging dogs people have to preserve a certain percentage of this land, not all of it. They have to preserve about half of it, but they don't have to preserve all of it, and they don't have to, they don't have to give it to the public. So they could put a conservation restriction with no public access on it. And initially, that's what she wanted to do. Um, and I think, frankly, her costs rose, and she was looking for a way to get cover her costs. This is the $13,000 parcel, is that right? Um, I the budget. Yes, that's right. Um, no, I'm sorry. No, the thirteen thousand. The thirteen thousand. Now I can't remember. One of them is uh, the John Clapp one, and one is this property. Um, this is this is the eleven thousand. Yeah, thirteen. It's eleven plus two. It is okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry for that. Mineral Hills. Yeah. So next one is Rocky Hills Greenway. This one's a, a yeah. sorry. Just before you leave this one, did you did you say that there's currently access to this parcel? I mean, there's trails. I walk there all the time, but no, there's no public there's access. No public access. Right, that's right. Um, and because she has had a problem with ATVs, there's actually hidden cameras in some of the trees. Uh, so I called her before I took the CPA after, so we didn't get caught on the camera. So, but when we walked there, we walked from the Glendale Road. That's right. So, so I, can you see the maps? Land. I'm going to show you the route we did. We sort of came down here. Wait, where is Glendale? Oh, it's over here on the right. Glendale's here. Yeah. So we came okay. from Glendale Road. We came through the property we owned, and then we came down here, and then we walked back over here through the dog park. Right. 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 So the big route that we're going to was actually on her property, and we walked back onto our property right here. I don't know if you remember, this area went through, it had a lot of flags that we crossed. That's so that was the marking? That was the marking we crossed. It. So when she decides what she wants to do in terms of access, she'll decide if she's, she could fence her whole property? She's fencing her property. She's going to. Yes, yeah, because the dog, because she's the dog, putting right. okay. six foot high fence. And then, frankly, that's why we're buying this, is that her cost for both engineering and fence was much higher than she anticipated. Mm -hmm. So she needs to sell this to make her project go forward. And is there access or an easement off a of Ridgeview Road there? Thank yes. Yep. Right. So it's very small, but we have, it's actually a wonderful way in. It's nice. We sort of sneak by the detention pond right here mm -hmm. to come on. And we um, generally have trail building is done by our partners, you know, our Brook Coalition and our partners. We don't have a partner here yet. So my office staff built the trail from one all the way to the other, including some boardwalk going through here. So it's already a very nice trail. It cuts over there. So this next one is the most expensive per acre because it has a lot of frontage. Um, it is, I will say, it is um, less than half. Actually, it's about a third of what the owner bought the property for a dozen years ago. And he spent another $20,000 tearing down a home. So the property has dropped a lot in value. Um, and you can see we're very into this property because we own on two sides of it already. So we want to fill that in. We want to play a small parking lot so people coming to this large conservation area can park. We are going to be building a bike path through this conservation area. It's over here. Um, and so having a parking lot, a very, you know, small parking lot, three or four cars, but having a parking lot next to a, a large conservation area and a bike path is important. So it's nice for that, but it's really mostly important for ecological purposes. Um, it, it's low. Um, the, one of the reasons the price drops so much is um, if you have property which was built before the Wetlands Protection Act and you keep the property up, you have the right to do it. He, in essence, tore down the home. This is the man who owns um, Rainer Door in East Hampton. He bought the property, planned to move Raynor Door here. He tore down the home. He then had a mini stroke, and his plans changed. He's, he's healthy, he still owns Raynor Door, but you know, 
he had a recovery. By the time he came forward, the house he tore down became weapons. Um, and so it has much less development potential than it did before. Um, but it's still very, you know, very small, but very nice property and key. And this one, we have Mass Audubon as a partner. Mm -hmm. And so that means two things, both they're throwing in some money, $5,000 at 10% of the purchase. They're throwing directly to us. And also, they're going to hold the conservation restriction. Usually, at the land we pay for, we buy with CPA, we have to put a CR on the property, and there's costs associated with putting a CR, so substantial costs associated with putting a CR on our property. So it's a big contribution from, from them as well. And they're, they've gone through their, whatever their internal committee process is, they've gone through, so they've now made their commitment to us of being our partner in this property. Where is the, what, on that one, you said possible plan, so there is bike path through there, right? That's that's the Manhattan? Yes, Manhattan so where, the bike where path. Where is our spur going to go? So the current bike, this is the bridge across East yeah. Hampton Road is oh, here. Yeah. The current bike path goes here. Yeah. The Manhattan, uh, the, um, we're calling it. Oh, well. Sorry, what did I do? that labeled Manhattan Rail Trail. Yes, we have to the north this. of Route 10, it's really not, is it? Right, Sarah will fix this. Um, so it's going from, uh, and we actually have, anyone's interested, we have a public hearing with MassDOT actually tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, but it's going from just north of the bridge across Route 10, yep. up to opposite the ice pond, so oh, very okay. close to the jail. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's a, you're, there's actually a, a gas pumping station over there. But, yeah. um, wow. So it's a, it's, it's a nice trail. We, we've tried to have very little parking lots. We've been, you know, other people build bike paths and do a lot of parking lots. Yeah. We've tried to do fingers of bike paths that serve every neighborhood, so we're trying to not have a lot, but there are places where you know, one or two parking spots. Mm -hmm. so. well, there's a lot of parking in East Hampton, like a mile down. Yeah, past, exactly. So. Right, so again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tiny piece, but, and, and the reason the park, we're not gonna build anything there, there's the old driveway that goes in to where the house was. Yeah. We want to reuse that existing driveway to allow parallel parking on one side. So it would be a parking lot, but it wouldn't, that's not a cost. We're just going to let people. What about the, is it one lot or a couple lots next to it to the south? It, right, there, there, there's two homes there already. Oh, they're okay. So, they're not going. Yeah, I mean, the homes burned down, but they're not, you know. Well, now if they do, they're going to look at you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Sure. Thank you for saving me. Right now, there's an informal parking lot on the other side of the bike trail. The other side. That's right. And, and as long as that's there, we probably wouldn't even advertise the other thing. But that's frankly a trespass on National Grid's property. We have no rights to do it. So you can get away with them. Don't mind park there all you want. But we just want to be ready to go if we get kicked off that side. Um, all right. So, so, Ar so Arcadia is a partner in this, even though it's on the other side of. Um, Route 10. They've been a partner on every property. We, this Rocky Hill Greenway area, which now has had four acquisitions, they've been a partner in every single one. Um, we partner with them here in the Meadows. What we tend to do is in the Meadows in their home territory, they own the property and we hold a conservation restriction. The number eight one, the one that I couldn't show you, that's one of those where they will actually own the property and we will bring in some money and we we'll hold a conservation restriction. Um, and the, in the Rocky Hill, we reverse it. We own the land and they hold a conservation restriction. So it's a nice partnership. So it's, because it, what they're interested in is there's a lot of wildlife that moves from their area all the way to upland area. So they're interested in that connection. Um, enough to contribute some money, but not enough to want to do 100%. That's in the forest. Yeah. We're doing another one, for example, actually, it's not on here. Um, I'll show you actually one more. This, I'm not asking for any money from you. I guess I, I could have claimed it as leverage, but I didn't. There's a parcel right here as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that is was owned by Ralph Thompson, the old Ralph the Blacksmith. Oh, yeah. um, and we're doing, so we have another source of money. So if people get behind in their taxes, it's called tax title. And we often get money from the mayor. So when land's in tax title, we still have to pay off the taxes like anybody else but we're paying it back to the city, so the cost of the city is less. Um, it's still a delay, you know, if, if we spend money FY 2018, we pay it back to the city, it's not released in 2020, um, so it's an opportunity cost. But 
So we're about to buy that parcel of land. The city will contribute the value of the back taxes, which is, I think, $18,000 is a big cost. And Mass Audubon will own the property out there. So it's costing us something, but again, it's out of this funny money pool, if I can. Um, so I don't put it in ledge, but, but you can see it's Mass Audubon's interest in having as much green that connects across Route 10 um, so that this you know, wildlife can pass as easily as possible. What about the piece right, the next piece down? Uh, this, yeah. that's the landfill. The old, the old landfill just now, the transfer station. Yes. So we would never touch that because it's full of buried yeah. waste underground. Uh, and they cleaned up a little bit. There were actually some things coming out of the hill over here on Mass Audubon's property. And they did a cleanup a few years ago when, when that land transferred to the current operator. But so this is sort of our acquisition boundaries will end here because even if they're giving us away, we wouldn't want to touch that, that property. Who, who owns that? It's a corporation. I don't, you know, I could tell you, I could look up the letters for it. I don't know who it is. It used to be. Um, Alan. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. But he right. sold that when he retired, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was, it was Alan for many, many years, but I don't know who the, the current operator is. There's no risk of substitution or anything. There's no risk of substitution. Yeah. Right. So. Sorry, because my ears really are ringing from the plane, I'm going to apologize for that. Um, uh, okay. So that's those are the ones that we're um, asking for your help in terms of paying for. Um, Frozen on me. Sarah, one more time. <laughs> Is there a trick? So you can see on the upper side we're going to talk about is five, six, and seven are the next ones we're going to talk about. They're all in the Salma Hills. So and there's a, there's actually a fourth one there as well. So we again a lot of these things are all your fault because you gave us money in the past. But we came before you maybe seven years ago and said, we want to professionalize our land management. We were buying a lot of land, but not necessarily doing surveys on the land. Um, and we've since changed our policy. Whenever we buy land, we survey it. It's built into soft costs for each property. But we came before you a few years ago and asked for help for a catch-up. And so we surveyed almost 1,000 acres in the Salma Hills as a, as a catch-up for doing it. And in that process, we discovered three separate parcels um, which were old estates that were sort of listed as owner unknown and the city had never done it. I'm sorry, at, at two parcels which were old estates. We weren't sending anybody a tax bill. We didn't know who owned it. We knew who owned it 100 years ago and didn't know what happened to the chain of title and so the assessors said, back land, we're not going to bother tracking it down. Um, but as we've been buying land around it, they now become gaps in the middle of our holdings. Um, we have now, in essence, frankly, lowered the opportunity cost, the, the, the value of that land, because we've, they're more landlocked now. Mm -hmm. You know, even if someone came forward from the family 100 years ago, they could never develop the property. So these are going to be pretty low-value properties. Low-value property is about $800 to $1,000 an acre. That's, that's as, bottom, as low as it gets. Um, so these are going to be the absolute least expensive land in the city, but there's still something. So that's the two on the left. Um, the one on the right is a similar one, but we did actually find somebody who's still alive who owns that and, and who wants to sell it. So they're all sort of similar properties. They're in holdings. We own, the one on the left, you can see the green. So we own around them. What's not shown on this map is deep there watershed land. So number seven, for example, is even more green next to it that, that's not owned by, for conservation, but it's owned by uh, DPW. Um, so again, they're not going anywhere, but they're really key pieces. We've been aware of them now for six years and now seem like the time to go forward. Um, it's so easier to cluster. Who, do you pay? Who are you paying them? So we actually put an escrow fund. Uh -huh. and oh, in case somebody shows up someday. In case someone sh shows up. And at some point, I'm not sure the exact process, but I think it show, will show eventually on the, you know, those things of, is this your money? Do a whole paid ad of oh, people yeah, yeah. walk away from bank accounts? Mm -hmm. I think it shows up in that list someday. Mm -hmm. And at wow. some point, it 
reverts to the city and the escrow then would go to back into the general city? I don't know if it it's a good question. I don't know if it will go to the city or if you turn over to Commonwealth. Like bank accounts that people walk away from and because they die get turned over to Commonwealth. I assume that applies to us as well. Um, but I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure about that. Um, we one of the reasons the timing is good, frankly, is because we've surrounded these properties, the mayor's always worried, any mayor, this group of every mayor I've worked for. When we take we have the right to take land by eminent domain. We don't like taking land against eminent domain against people who are alive. We've been fine to take it against people who died a hundred years ago. But there's always, in theory, a liability for the city, right? Somebody can sue us. If we notify the entire heirs, they can sue us within, I think it's a five-year period. If we can't find an heir and they come forward at some point, they can sue us forever. So there's some liability, but you know, the mayor's convinced the liability for these is so minimal and that we're putting up a fair amount in escrow that it's, it's a theoretical liability. We have done this in the past, two mayors ago, the city solicitor was very much into eminent domain as a way to clean up title, and we've done this maybe 15 times in the past and never had a lawsuit. You know, um, so, so they're great pieces, and, and they actually have a minor benefit for the Northampton one, which is there's a whole network of trails there, and that map where I showed you the Northampton one going through there, we're showing it going through the Salma Hills. So we know generally where it's going to go, but we haven't figured out which of several parallel trails were used. This just gives us more options. Again, we don't plan to build new trails, but do we use a trail on land we already own or someone there, you know, gives more options. We may or may not take advantage of that option. Wait, so the value of these is just the assessed value? Is that? The value is the assessed value. And for these parcels, be, the one on the right is an assessed parcel. The assessors had that in the books. Mm -hmm. The two on the left, they didn't even have on their books. But, but they will assess they get, So they gave us an estimate. So Joan Sarafin gave us an estimate of, what she would have assessed it for, and that's what we're using. That's correct. Um, and that's that eight hundred to a thousand dollars. That's correct. And how how large are these parcels? Um, the the small I, I don't have those numbers with me. The smallest one is about eight acres. The largest one is about twenty acres. Um, and the one on the right is somewhere between those two. It also it's a minor savings that we, as part of this professionalization. Besides surveying our property, we have to blaze all our property boundaries and keep those up to date. And so having in holdings just makes it more expensive for us to, to monitor our property. Wayne, the four properties you described for us, um, I think part of the rationale for getting a good price that they weren't developable. That's correct. That's a word. Right, I'm not claiming um, it, but yeah. I okay, but there are other ones that are developable that um, we often put aside for conservation purposes, CPCs often um, might help to subsidize those. And once in a while I hear from my neighbors that how come we're taking all this land off of the tax rolls, so to speak. Yeah. How do you respond to those queries? So two responses. First is we've done, with your support, a lot of limited development parcels. So we often look at these large parcels and say, what should we carve off? Unfortunately, you won't see this all in here. But um, in this big map over here, that Glendale Road one, again, we carved off four lots and gave them to the habitat. So we identified the areas which ecologically had the least impact. Um, so having them developed wasn't a bad thing, and we preserved the property. The much larger one is this one over here that I'm pointing to. That's the Burt's Bog area. And that one we carved off 12 buildings, um, two of which will be very high end, two, uh, three of which are moderate, and, the, and uh, three are affordable, and the ones are sort of entry-level lots. So we're certainly creating some lots. Um, we had a goal seven years ago of preserving a certain percentage of the city, because city councilors, uh, Jesse Adams actually, he was a councilor eight years ago, said exactly that. So he said, I want to know when you've reached the goal. And so we reached a, a, a consensus to get to 25% by 2018. And then we said we'd re-examine that at 2018. We came back to City Council last year and said, here's what we did in 2011. There's two ways we could do this. One is we could reach a new target for the next seven years. And the other is we could reach a target that we're trying to carve out enough building lots 
both through zoning changes and these are called limited development and limited development that we're not artificially inflating the value of land or reducing taxes to the city um, and that and counselors universally said we want to go to have that so we're we're very much looking at how to do these limited developments um, we just had an article published in a national publication here a week ago actually on limited developments because um, Northampton's one of the leaders in this area. Exactly. So that, that's the part about allowing land for development so we're not inflating the value of land. Mm -hmm. Then the separate piece about taxes, that is a different answer, which is we, every few years, we're going through this right now, the last time we did it was about nine years ago, we look at what's the cost of services to open space and what's the cost of services for development. And there's two competing methodologies out there, both of which I think are pretty lousy, frankly. There's this thing that American Farmland Trust has used, where they look at the average cost of services, and they're saying you always lose on housing. But it's a really bad methodology. I mean, it makes sense the way they're using it. It's, it's being used by other people other than AFT incorrectly, because a lot of development costs are marginal. Our schools, for example, are dropping in, in school enrollment, so we don't have to build a new school. We don't have to hire new firefighters. So we, our, our marginal cost of development is really, really low, except when we build roads. So we're trying to encourage development along existing roads, but it's not new snow plowing routes, not new police routes, all those kinds of things. Um, but the school kids don't have a huge impact. On us. And so we've run those numbers on what's the, you know, what's the actual cost. So one of the things we've looked at, for example, is I can't point because I have to release confidential information, but we've looked at new subdivisions in this area. And the new subdivisions in this area, I don't have the exact number, but it was close to an average of four people per dwelling unit and two school-aged children per dwelling unit. At, I'm not sure the numbers, $12,000 per student, we lose money in those homes. Um, downtown, we have 1.84 people per dwelling unit, and we have 0.25 people so we know the smaller again I like kids this is not an anti-kid yeah. thing but from a straight tax standpoint it is anti-kid thing right. so we so we we prepared all those numbers so we can answer those questions well, I, I mean do you make the I mean obviously you can make some assumptions but the density you're putting I mean, you're just using the current zoning. So this, well, this assessment is for new homes. We're not talking about raw. We're just saying here's the note. We've looked at development in new subdivisions mm -hmm. um, and how many that we have. It, the information on people 17 and above is public. Mm -hmm. Information on 17 and below is confidential, but we're allowed to have it as long as we conglomerate it enough so people can't. Depersonal sense, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, this is, I mean, you know, we want housing. We do a lot about encouraging new housing. This isn't an anti housing thing, but just from a straight tax standpoint, sure. we don't make money in housing. Um, when you said those targets, you said the 7 million dollars. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 you were about to ask the question oh, I was about to ask, I think. So that, is that an acreage target, or is it? A, so the, the target we had from 2011 to 2020, uh, 2018 mm -hmm. was we wanted to get the city to 25% of the city's open space. Oh, it's that target. So we were about 15% open space in 2011. We hit to that 25% in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so that we don't have. So the new target is just how do we create enough building lots enough that we're not seeing inflation of land from development. So I want to follow up on that before we move on, Mike, because it's really interesting to me. So do you, do you recall how you guys arrived at that 25% figure? There was no magic to it. We basically tried to have a discussion about here's our target. We, we, we basically said, I guess the honest answer is in 2011, we said, here's how much we're buying per year. If we keep doing that, is anybody uncomfortable with it? And no one, including Jesse, was the one who was most worried, was worried about getting to 25%. So we basically said it's a great debate to have in 2018. We don't have to have it here. You're, you're comfortable if we buy the, the average about 150 acres per year. If we're buying 150 acres per year, by 2018, we'll be at 25%. Is that okay? And they all said yes. But if like you go to the Mass Municipal Association meeting next year and a bunch of people get around the table and start talking, is there any sort of consensus as to what communities for like quality of life Look yeah. at for there are a lot of published figures out there about formalized parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. How much you should have per person, you know, per thousand people. Right. There's even some data that's not as good on in more rural areas. Like New York, we use artificial turf. So you can use the fields 24 hours a day. 
yeah. we need our fields to rest. But but those numbers we have. Got it. But no, for open space, there's not. Okay. And then just um, before we move on, uh, you mentioned an article on limited development. Um, what's the citation on that? So let me let me send it to you. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Um, I'll, I'll give it to Sarah sure. and ask her to send okay, it all. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You write it? <laughs> we, the Royal We wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pro I mean, I wrote the article, but the projects are the Royal We. I mean, the entire department's been involved, and you guys have been involved. I mean, you know, we, it, it was funny, actually, I, I apologize for taking tangents, but we first started doing limited developments. We'd do like one lot here and one lot there, and we thought developers wouldn't like it because we're competing with developers. We thought city council wouldn't like us from the development business. And the turnaround actually is when we got to Burke's Bog and we came before city council and said we'd like to carve off three or four lots. And it was the councilors who said, this is great, do more of them. And so we went back to the, the drawing board and said, okay, we think we can do you know, a more number out there. Um, and so that, so we changed it. And there are a lot of work. And, and Burke's Bog, we still have some law. We have a court, you know, we, somebody put a deposit on two lots and backed away and he wants his entire deposit back and so he's suing us for his deposit. So we're probably not going to do another one until we finish that one up. <coughs> We've been doing about one every year and I say we're taking off now while we deal with that one. So I, I have I mean, the budget here you all have that so I don't have any to say again. We, we think for all these the prices are great. Um, they're lower than many parcels you see because it's not a lot of development value for these properties out there. Which, of course, is why none of these are good candidates for limited development projects. And again, that uh, the second project, the reason 50 plus 5 is not 55, is that mass all the ones kicking in that project. That's correct. That's correct. So that doesn't even show up on this list here, right? Yeah. So that one that's under wetlands protection now, is it buildable at all? We think there's a small piece. We don't know. You know, we had Conservation Commission turn down a project off Mineral Hills, I mean off um, Route 66, and then they sued and you settled? What was the final offer? We lost in court? Uh, which one was it? The one right next to the ridge. Uh, <coughs> uh, no, that one they approved. The, the other one we, is still uh, okay. in court. You know, the honest answer is a conservation commission probably could approve a project and probably could deny a project, and we don't know what a court would do. It's sort of a gray line area there. You have property there. Okay. And so buying it sort of takes that, you know, it's area we don't want development, so buying it sort of removes that risk from us. It's not a good place for development. Okay, but theoretically there could be a house there, so that's why that's still it, a, it probably theoretically this value. It's actually zoned industrial, so theoretically oh. it would be the more likely use might be um, a cut. I mean, originally, Rainbow Door wanted to go there. That size project I don't think would be approved. <coughs> but, you know, often people want a contractor to lay down the yard, a place to store their backhoes and mm -hmm. their piles of fill. And that can work in weird geometries. So, probably it's something that could be done. Other questions for Wayne? Thank you. Thank you. Been reading Wikipedia, it's talking to you. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, as always, thank you very much. Thank you. And also, no again next week says public ears comment. Uh, you Sorry, you myself. Oh, uh, you can. Okay. Okay. All right. Three and out, right? A little less work for us this time. So, moving on, <coughs> Sarah's uh, giving us a handout which is uh, for us to look at the uh, four city council orders. Is that right, four? Uh, correct. So these are the four small grants. Four small yeah. grants that we have approved. Give me more of this. And uh, so maybe we just take a moment, can we, to look at them, to read them? I don't, these were not sent to us by email, right? They weren't, no. I meant okay. to. So how about just a couple of minutes to look it over and folks can see if we have comments.
historic Northampton. This is from the undesignated funds reserve. It's not eligible for the historic preservation. No, that uh, good test. That that one should be historic. I will change that. I, that was the last one I did, and I was so used to writing that. Thing. So it is first on our list, and we are changing that from CPA undesignated funds to CPA historic preservation funds. Correct. Have got that? Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. That's payment for my ride home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank Third proposal, the Lathrop one. The second, whereas, uh, is that the project will continue help to improve or to help improve? To help improve. There's something a little funky in the next whereas also. Close. So does the CPC have a history of breaking off the small grants and giving that to the council before the next round is decided on? Yes. Is that what we do? Yep. Relatively new policy. I've forgotten how we do this. Do we uh, vote on these as a package or do we go one after the other? You can do them all. The you can do them all. Well, we approve Hall 4's package. Is there a second? Yeah. Discussion? So does that total amount limit us to then what we're going to approve in the next round of these major projects? Yeah, so the 369, 12,000 come out of this uh, 300,000, is it, that we have for this round, which leaves us with 288. Is that right? And that still leaves us with more than enough to fully fund all three of the projects. That's what we're But yeah, George, you're right. Moving forward in the sequence of these things, we often get we often are asked to approve these before we get to the big big yeah. box. Um, which I consider to be a little bit problematic, but the fact is, is that these are usually, there are not too many of them, and because they're small dollar item, even if we enact the whole package, it usually doesn't have a significant impact on our ability to do our will on the other ones. Um, sure. sure. But we've also decided sometimes to take a small yeah. and put it into the right. general yeah. consideration. We've done both things. Yeah. So I think we always take in everything we have, look at the small ones, consider them in proportion to what we have in total and say, okay, let's keep it now, do all the small decisions, or let's kick it into the general decision. I think this is the most small grants we've ever yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just clarify, um, we talked last time about not having met the historic uh, set aside. So how much has to be reserved out of 
the available funds for that. I thought we were at uh, just about 300,000 even minus the 12 for the small okay, uh, so projects, 288. So there's 61,000 left at the historic reserve after this one project. So that's 219? Um, I have one. Uh, what did I do wrong? 288 minus 269. What, 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 what are you trying to get at? No, nothing. How much money can we actually spend after the 12 and the historic reserve? I guess is the question. Right. This is not, I mean, we can vote on this though. Right? So we have about $198,000 in projects before us. Um, of that, what, what do you say, Sarah, 61 or is that now minus 3, 58? No, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's and the usual funding. So, 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 so even yeah. with that's, that's the sixty one. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so sixty one and twelve. There, there, there will be money we're remaining we're in the historic reserve, reserve that will carry over to the FY twenty. Right, thirty of what we're doing is historic. Correct. If we choose to get so we had sixty one set aside minus three is fifty eight thousand set aside for historic preservation. Is that correct? Sixty one after sixty one after. Okay. So um if we, so we can continue to do everything. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so there's motion on the floor to approve all four of these small grants. Uh, and there was a second, right? Any further discussion on this? All those in favor? All those opposed? All right. Uh, any other business not foreseen when agenda was published? We can encourage folks to be coming out two weeks from now, uh, where we will have our public comment and then be moving on to our discussion as well. Uh, discussion same night as public comment? I think that's what we've tried to do before, and since we only have three projects, um, you know, the, the uh, I mean, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see. We certainly had about five zillion letters of support for the Florence National Register project, and if in fact a lot of people come. Yeah. I don't think it'll be quite as uh, interesting, except that that's the wrong word, as our last controversial. Uh, oh, right. Warm. 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 It was warm. You remember we're still on camera? I think I blew that last time. Uh, any other business? Okay, motion to adjourn. Seven. And a second. Second. All right. Two weeks.